uh, paper is addressing the semantic gap in video sensors and applications. And actually, I really fought hard for this paper because uh, personally, I, I think that this is represents a real uh, issue, um, especially as uh, as the vision community gets closer and closer to be able to do a lot of the things that they want to do in real time uh, to actually build real multimedia systems with the vision component. Um, we're starting to see a, a, a mismatch, or basically what Uchi is going to talk about is a semantic gap between the representations that we like to use as multimedia systems researchers and uh, what the vision people want to talk about in terms of features and higher higher order semantics. And so I'll let uh, Uchi. All right. So the uh, cool thing about following up a talk that you're interested in is you can ask another question, and you know, <laughs> it's good. I think you guys have the wrong market for your delay measurement. I think, and I'm not saying anything about the video games I play, but you know, if you could port something to like a PlayStation 3, Rock Band, and Guitar Hero, measuring the lag, you have to set that manually, and it's a total pain in the butt. But your system would be perfect for that. So. Anyway, so I'm uh, here to talk about this addressing the semantic gap in video sensor networks. I've been working in video sensor networks for a while, and as I get older, it's just I want to do stuff that's more interesting. So you tend to s talk to people that aren't computer scientists, like you know, intelligent transportation systems folk, and you find that they have all kinds of problems that we as a community haven't been able to really address. And so this is uh, it's more of an initial work, so I'm kind of motivate it and give you some initial results. And the uh, hope is that we can start engaging more of the computer vision community at L and kind of get them into our community and solve some bigger problems. Um, this was done with a number of collaborators. We're basically working on this as we speak. So um, if you look at video sensors, um, the actual deployments of them uh, in video surveillance system, habitat monitoring, y you know, they're becoming fairly commonplace, right? It's every couple months you hear about some random rare species like the jaguar in Peru that was captured because we were able to deploy sensors out in the middle of some jungle, right? Um, and I feel that we're only scratching the surface of what we can actually do. So if you look at, at least in the United States, um, healthcare monitoring is a huge uh, issue. We have the baby boomers, right? So we've got this large population kind of starting to age. And one of the things that healthcare people talk about is the fact that um, dementia is a really big problem. And the fact that if you can detect it early, then the care that you're able to deliver to the person, the quality of their life, you can increase it and also decrease the cost. So this has a huge economic impact. The big problem is what they're trying to figure out is how the uh, early onset of dementia has some vi significant markers. And so what they're looking towards is video sensor technologies trying to create action so that they can then determine, ooh, this is something that we might want to look into. So there's applications in healthcare, environmental monitoring, right? You guys know about global warming. There's all these impacts on... Um, uh, various, you know, the Arctic, we're, we're seeing issues in Oregon, and I'll get to an example in a little bit. Uh, we're also seeing um, quite a few intelligent transportation system um, things that we can enable if we kind of build these systems right. So I'll, the last two I will sort of go into more detail in a little bit. So one of the things is th that we're doing in Oregon, you know, the green Oregon, is this um, fish monitoring. And the idea here is that um, the livelihood of the fish kind of tells us how we're impacting the environment. And so in Oregon, there's about 14 dams. And what they do is um, there are these fish ladders in the dams that the fish, you know, um, come upstream. And, and there's a window. And basically what they do is they feed all the fish through this window. And then they have a guy sitting here on a specialized keyboard. And what this poor person does <laughs> is, <laughs> so it, he has to do, do a couple of things. One is um, classify the age of the fish. And you can't see it in this, you see it in this picture. There are these two lines. So basically an adult is classified as being 18 inches long and a jack is less than that. And then there's a bunch of different fish. 
uh, the top four here are basically species of salmon. And so they're going in and distinguishing different species of salmon. Um, and then they're also determining whether they're um, born in a hatchery or in the wild. And the way they do this is if they're born in a hatchery, before they release them, they cut off this little adipose fin, right? And so those, as they're coming through the system, they go hatchery, not hatchery. And so that represents all these different buttons that they have. Um, and so if you ever ha get a chance, go visit one of these people. They will love to talk to you, so you go in there because it's kind of like solitary confinement for them. <laughs> They're like, you're leaving so soon, and we were there for half an hour, right, and he's counting fish. Um, so anyway, that's one example, and so what they're really trying to do is they go, we should be able to replace, not that we want this person out of a job, but y we should be able to replace this and help automate this entire process. Um, another example is intelligent transportation systems. Um, we have a, a group out at Portland State that's uh, very active. Uh, one of the unique things about Oregon, you know, all that stuff in Portlandia is actually true. Um, they, they allow the um, ITS folks to actually make changes to the actual transportation systems and then kind of figure out if they actually worked or not. Um, so we do weird things like we paint these green boxes everywhere, you know, for bicyclists to make sure they're safe. And then the other thing they do is they're trying to measure, you know, so this car is cutting off this bicyclist, right, making a right turn. So they're interested in these kinds of conflicts, all right. Um, for crosswalks, it's the same thing. Um, by law in Oregon, uh, the pedestrians have right away, so this intersection doesn't have any lights on it. And so as a pedestrian is crossing, cars are required to stop. As you can imagine, that's not always the case, right? And so there will be what they call near misses. A car will stop like in the intersection. Um, there will be times when a pedestrian is just walking and you know, a car blows by. And you know, what they do is they sit out, you know, when they actually want to do these kind of measurements, it's the same thing. You get an undergraduate, sit out there for two hours, count, right? And so again, they have, you know, when we start talking to them about implementing some of these video things, they, they had so many applications, they're just like, stop. How about just one, right? And so we started with this one. Uh, later on, we'll see this crosswalk example. Um, and so these are the kinds of applications that we think we can enable, but we have to, as systems people, provide sort of something that can actually do what we need it to do. Um, and so as we're building these things, basically you, you realize that there's this uh, semantic gap, which is basically we define as the, the sort of mismatch between what the data that's collected from the video sensor network, right, the raw frames of video, and then the information that you actually need to make useful choices. So one of the things they're interested in for the ITS example is if there's a large number of conflicts between pedestrians and cars, then maybe signaling upstream can help mitigate that a little bit. So they're interested in, you know, kind of these feedback systems. Um, other things for crosswalks, if you, you know, a lot of them are based on sort of the 95% rule, right? And so if there's a runner, just gets across the street and then traffic sits there for the other minute waiting for a regular pedestrian to walk, right? And so there are these kind of um, sort of differences that we have to deal with. And so if you think about this, this is what we call the semantic gap. So we have the sort of data that's being delivered by the sensor network on the top and the questions you want to ask. So the question is, well, how do we cover this gap? So today, right, we as humans come down to the video sensor level, right? So we have the humans sitting in this room basically doing all the counting, right? And obviously, you know, this is not very scalable. So what they end up doing here is just they do samples and then using statistics, right, extrapolate over time. Um, and it's very expensive, right? You have to pay a lot. Well, undergraduates are relatively cheap, but it's still expensive if you talk to NSF, right? Um, and so, you know, this is long-term, not kind of the thing we want, plus it doesn't give us research problems. Um, the other way you can do this is kind of what they do today. You can take these raw video frames and do a very singular, and this is why I gave it a very narrow arrow, very singular solution. So you can imagine, oh, I've got this intersection, so let me hard code a bunch of crap into this thing, right, and let it run. 
And I stop this thing short because there are times where, well, you know, you have all these different prob possibilities hard-coded, and then something else comes up, and you're kind of toast, right? So it, it really, you know, it's a little bit brittle. The other thing is, in some of these cases, even if you could, say, count fish, like, so the system with the raw video can count fish, one of the issues is you can't distinguish fish species, right? So if you look at fish, right, those four types of fish were all salmon types. And so that's kind of like distinguishing uh, the nationality of a person in a video, right? And it, it's much more difficult than, you know, distinguishing just the person, right? And, and so that's why there's kind of, yes, you can do it a little bit, but it's still kind of hard. And really what you want to be able to do is sort of do this large scale, right? And if you think about the general solution, right, kind of the, the gold standard, think about it just for the crosswalk, right? So now you have to build this computer vision system that is able to look at, I need to find the sidewalk, right? And not only do I need to find the sidewalk, I have to deal with the fact that there are perspective issues, lighting issues, obstruction issues, et cetera. And so you have to build all of these things into the software system, right? And so typically, you know, this would result in extreme code bloat because you're putting all this stuff into the system to make it completely general, right? The other thing is, right, it may not even be possible, right? And again, I bring up that example of the fish species, right? You just, it's like telling the nationality of people, right? And so it's just very hard. So what we're proposing is that let's, br let's basically solve this by bringing humans into loop. So have the humans address part of this system and basically take human input and some manual processing, right? And then also have the, computer, the underlying uh, computer vision system or the video processing system basically do some of the processing based on the input, all right? And, and so if you do something like this, right, one of the things you end up, the conclusions you come up with are, you know, some of the parameters are easily specified by humans, right? So for example, finding out where these lines are, right, you as a human just, okay, you set up your camera, Line, line, 18 inches, you're done, right? Rather than all that code required to actually do that. Same thing with the sidewalk, you just, there's a sidewalk, run away, right? Um, so the things we were interested in is trying to figure out ways to enter parameters into the system and then, you know, forcing that down into the computer vision algorithms. Now obviously, I'm not a computer vision person, one of my collaborators is, Right, some of the underlying computer vision algorithms we still are stuck with, and I chose some of the examples in the experimentation section just to, to show you that you know this isn't you know a complete solution for everything. Um, so we have this thing we call semantic bridges, and the idea is that we have a simple interface to s allow someone to specify inputs into the computer vision system. I'll explain what that is in a minute. And then we have a visual programming interface that basically allows users to it connect things. So think Lego Mindstorm. So the idea is that a lot of the processing steps, the uh, non-computer scientists, like the ITS folk, they know exactly what they want to do. It's just they, they can't express it you know, in a way, in a programming way, without being programmers. And so you have to bring a computer scientist into the room. And so we're trying to get away from that. It's kind of like, let's give them something that they can build their solution because you know 10 minutes later, they're gonna wanna do it for something else. <laughs> um, we want it to be refinable, so you know, a lot of the things that they're looking into, they don't know the answers to, and so they constantly make adjustments. So we wanna make sure it's refinable and replayable, right? Okay, so how are we doing this? Um, or what are we proposing to? We have um, basically three types of components. Sources, which are video cameras, abstracted sensor networks. Um, we have these processing elements, which actually do the work. And then basic operations. And this is where we get into the programming part of this. And we've kind of laid out and and or. Um, we've thought about not, but for various reasons, we've not included it for right now. Um, the processing elements are basically where all the work gets done. Um, and they basically do things like simple pixel processing, so 
you might do scene detection, right? Has something moved? Um, but by and large, we expect them to be hooked into computer vision algorithms, right? Um, and so examples would be removing video with no motion, restrict processing to a subregion, right, to make the computer vision more um, scalable, uh, line triggered processing, object size selection, et cetera. And so I'll give you an example of what we mean by this. So this is not implemented just yet. We, we've implemented a single box as of uh, today. Um, and, but this is sort of the vision that we're moving towards. Um, and so the idea is that a user can bring up this box and they go, all right, I, have a, I want a video stream, select something from here and hook it up to a video. And then basically the video flows through the system. Um, this movement box is something that says, okay, just pass on the video if there's movement. If there's no movement or no change, just drop it on the floor. Comes in here. And so what we've done in this example is this is our basic um, uh, pedestrian vehicle uh, intersection problem, all right? So in this box up at the top, you'll see there's this red, red box here. You might not be able to see this in the back. Basically, that's saying restrict processing for this video component to this region. And then there are these um, purple lines at the end. And these are the line triggering things. So what ends up happening is this video processing engine, as users walk across here, it goes, this is something of interest. Okay? And then basically what you can do is our envision system has a bitmap. Basically, you bitmap the whole frame. And so as video flows through the system, you're, you're tagging which frames have been you know, uh, tagged as interesting. You'll note on this one, we've got it the other way around. So we've got a larger box, and then the triggers are on the end. So the idea here is that this box is triggering or marking all video that has a pedestrian crossing the street. This one has basically triggers for cars going from this side to this side. And then basically what we want to do is and this video stream and this video stream, which means that there's a pedestrian and a car, right? And the idea is that, you know, even if you didn't have this completely automated, you can now distill your video system into just a smaller segment that, you know, if you're going to do manual counting, that you can do this on. Um, and so the idea here is that, you know, as they're deploying more and more of these things, right, if you think about setting something like this up, right, you click on a box, you enter this, you click on a box, you can, for a fairly low cost, right, imp you know, set this thing up and then just kind of let it run. So that's kind of our vision for how we can start integrating some of this stuff into a system that's uh, usable. All right, so um, for this particular work, we've implemented this video processing element, and uh, what we've done is done some pixel detection, uh, finding objects, and then we do object tracking. And then we've also implemented the region, um, region of interest and the end lines. Um, we've taken two video segments. One is uh, on an overcast day. One of the things you find out is if you look at all the computer vision uh, uh, papers out there, almost all of them are on overcast days, right? And we've, we now know why, right? So when you have a bright, sunny day, you end up with large shadows, and large shadows cause all kinds of havoc. And I saw this, um, my students were going through it, and I said, we need to include this just because it's useful to kind of know what the limitations, you know, we as systems people want to know what the limitations are. And so we took both of these things, and then basically we implemented this pedestrian counting video component, right? And it was just that. We highlighted the region, end spots, and then said, count the number of people. How good are you? Um, so the system ran, and this is just an example of the little objects that it's pointed out, right? And then we just had it count anything that, you know, crossed those end lines. A thin white car? Like a, mi it, like a micro car? Yeah, well, you know, this is America. And we don't drive anything less than 18 feet long. 
<laughs> no, but yes, seriously, like, I mean, <laughs> most of the cars do cover multiple lines, but yeah. We are, you know, now that our gas is like $4, you actually start seeing people drive smaller cars, which is fantastic in my opinion. All right, so anyway, what ended up happening? Um, on the overcast day, this thing actually was very close, right? The, it's, it was close with the following caveat. Um, basically, two people were counted as one in one instance because they were walking right next to each other, right? And it was viewed as one object. Um, and there was one where a car was covering the pedestrian, and this is actually one that would be of interest because what that means is there was a, a person walking and a car went in front, all right? And so these are the kinds of things we hope to eventually pull out. Um, and then we had one person that was unfortunately split into two. <laughs> what can you do? Um, <laughs> on the, um, the sunny day one, it had significant problems with the shadows. And by and large, most of the time what happened was the shadow was counted as one and the person was counted as another. So that's why it was more than double. Right, and so, but this is a this is going to be a problem with all computer um, vision libraries. And so, what you see with the ITS folks is, they've also when they report on things that are automated, it's all on overcast days, right? And so the idea is, you know, somewhere I'm hoping between us and the computer vision community, we can come with something that can solve this more generically. Um, and so our goal is hopefully to start really figuring out ways to bring these communities together and. Um, solve some of these uh, problems that are going to occur everywhere. Um, all right, so there's a bunch of uh, related work. Um, one of my students did this Sense TK several years back. Um, this was meant for video sensors, and in hindsight, it's really meant for computer programmers to bring video sensors together, and it's not meant for the non-computer scientists. And a lot of these you know, the directed fusion tiny db. These are all kind of abstractions for sensor networks. And again, they're generally focused at computer scientists. And so what we're really trying to do is something like the Lego Mindstorms. Those of you who have kids, you've probably played with these things. They have these boxes that are just functional boxes and you can just, you know, the program flow is basically the, the lines connecting boxes. And so what we want to do is get that kind of interface but have these things as the components, right? And then that way we can start moving forward on you know, more advanced video sensors. All right, so we are currently building the interconnection. So we're, we've now got to the point where we're building the bigger boxes, and we hope to have those connected at some point soon. Um, we're also starting along this path. Someone had mentioned earlier about real-time computer vision algorithms, right? By and large, the computer vision stuff is fairly slow. Um, you can reduce the size of the video, but that affects object tracking and all sorts of things. So what I'm hoping we as a community can start spending some time on is this kind of work. Um, and kind of like with the video stuff, kind of, OK, well, what are the trade-offs if we want to start doing this adaptively? You know, what is the impact on this? So I think there's a ripe area for us as a community to start thinking about. Um, now that we gave them this basic system that just does w the one intersection, these guys came back to us and were like, we want to do this, right? They want to be able to do conflicts between bicycles and cars, because this whole um, cars cutting off bicycles, this is a huge political issue in Portland. Um, other things they have in mind are, we have the craziest intersections, probably you know, up at the Boston scale. You know? We have a bus line, a uh, well, sorry, this is a tram line, a bus line, a car, bicycles, pedestrians, and then this is a street car, not the, the max line, right? And all these come together at this one intersection. And these guys really want to understand what is the impact of pedestrians running across in front of the trams, et cetera. Um, so there's all kinds of these interesting scenarios. So I, I, I suspect we'll have lots of interesting you know, use cases and, you know, if you decide you want to start working on this, I can probably get you some footage if you want it. Okay, so um, in summary, we're just trying to figure out what um, better interfaces are for humans and video sensor networks, and we think that they can enable, like, much better discovery. 
And the interesting thing is, I think it requires this confluence of systems, real systems, computer vision, which means implementable computer visions, algorithms, um, and interface design. Um, so we're having a lot of fun. This is uh, initial work, so you'll probably, hopefully, see some more advanced stuff um, soon. All right. Questions, comments? Basically, apply some of the machine learning to actually anticipate based on certain uh, time, for example, what mm -hmm. does the video sort of and region maybe might need to be looking at to actually assist maybe the computer mm -hmm. vision algorithms. I'm just wondering, are you going in that direction of this so multimodal? So I think uh, what we're focused on is something, you know, I think if you look at the image retrieval community, they're looking at the, the really hard problem, which is more generalized, right? I think what we're after is we're not looking for the computer to know everything. What we're trying to do is figure out what can the human bring to the right. equation. And so, uh, you know, I, I think what will happen is there, the work that's going on in that community, as it develops, we're hoping we'll just integrate into the box. Well, the, 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 the question for me is that as you have the video camera, you know, you, yeah. talk, you, you have talked about this raw information, that the video cameras currently are providing additional information which are for free there. If, uh, like the timestamps, when particularly, if, for example, the time could drive you to um, uh, deploy certain type of computer visions because you might expect a lot of people bridging, a mm -hmm. single person bridging because it's a lunch time. Is it a yeah. time that currently very little traffic comes? That's just a, that's a very free raw information if you it's are thinking of starting to build it in. Yes, yes. No, you can certainly like, yeah, have it adaptive in with respect to the number of people. Yeah, absolutely. Hi. Hi. Is it working? Yes, yes, it's recording for the video. Okay. Um, a question about your logic for combining uh, yes. the operators or mm -hmm. detections. Did you consider adding time information? So, uh, yeah, we, we had a lot of discussions about this. And, um, you know, we thought about just parsing the video, right? Um, so, uh, I'm approaching this whole research area as you know, if you think about the sensor community 10 years ago, it was more like, let's just get a bunch of applications out there. Let's see how they work, how they f fail, right? And then once we have that, then we can actually start generalizing, right? And I think that's kind of where we are now. Um, so for this, you know, we just want to get this system running. And so one of the things we thought about was, you know, like this movement. You could, rem you could if you had a video stream and there was nothing moving, you could just pull that data out. One of the problems you run into then is if you're trying to mix two streams together that have the same time, now you've got, you've got to manage all these times. And so we're trying to just go with relatively simple to start off with. And so what we decided was that each of these components passes on all the video. It just does a simple binary marking. And so the idea is that you kind of get the timestamps are integrated in the video, right? So you're just going to pass a bitmap with this and a bitmap with this. This gets essentially the same video with bitmaps, right? And so you just need to combine them that way. Um, so we didn't want to get into the point where we're having to implement a whole ton of logic into these systems. Version 2, we might switch, right? But I think that's where we're going right now. I, I was more thinking in terms of, like, the example where you say, the car was detected yes. as a person or a person is detected as a car or counted as the car? No, that yeah. was a car went in front of the person, so it, uh, it obstructed the person and y the computer vision algorithm yeah, because, lost because it. Because basically you're, you're, detecting, you're trying to detect two independent events in the same location in the video. Yes. If you, d if you would detect, like, the car was there before and there after, and, and the pedestrian was there, you could... Before, yes. You could conclude... You could do the inference, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So you, you would need time for that. You would need to say, this event happened at that time, happened at that time, and then so that. So the way that, that would be time. implemented is that we would actually, so in, in this one, in this case, we had the car come in front of the person. So what you would end up doing is this is the person watching thing, right? And we're trying to keep all the application semantics out of these processing boxes. But if you wanted to, that what you would end up doing is saying, if there's a person here and a person, you know, so you would 
start building in these cases where you had something, you lost it, but then something came out over on the other side. You could implement that even with the presence of the car, right? And so some of that you can solve by doing, you know, inside of individual box. Uh, our principle is trying to keep as keep these boxes as simple as possible. And the reason for this is we want to just get these in the hands of the people implementing it, and then, right, they're going to want to say, well, I want the fish to be X, Y, Z. I was like, no, you just tell it the length, <laughs> right? Give it the lines, give it the length, and it will just spit these out, right? And then, or it will just give you the small video segments that you want to see. And so what we're hoping is that, you know, I think we're fairly good as a community. If you have a single thing that you want to get done, we can kind of do it. You know, it might take, you know, special cameras or whatever, but I think we can build singular applications. We're going after the bigger thing, which is there's a bunch of the non-computer scientists, they have, apparently Hollywood has been very good. They, they have all kinds of ideas of what we can do, and we're like, no, this is computer science 2012, this is not, or 2013, right? This isn't, you know, the year 3000 yet, so, but yeah. So I, I am a little bit puzzled because I, I'm not sure what is your focus. So on the one side, you, you try to get expert knowledge into the system. So in, on this point, what you are doing is, is knowledge engineering and expert systems. On the, on the other, ha other hand, you really try to gap the semantic, br um, the, to bridge the semantic gap, which, yes. as Clara said, is actually a, a huge topic. We, there are a lot of uh, yes. works on, on this. So, so in, in known uh, domains, uh, even much, more, much harder problems are, are very well solved. Also, in, so in the way of human of the loop. So I, I'm not sure so what wha is your, your so focus. So what I would say, so what we're trying to do is provide a mechanism by which we can do this generally. So like, I, okay. like you were saying is, yeah, it's, you can build this application today for this intersection. Moving it to another intersection requires significant work. And so I'm sitting here as a systems person going, why do we keep building these <laughs> silos, yeah, okay. right? We need to start thinking about doing something more general. The problem with the completely general is you have to build all this crap into the computing system, right? And so we're like, okay, our solution to this is, well, let's involve the human a little bit and then build up from the bottom, right? So but ours but is but kind do of- you, Do you think that this end or will be sufficient? So, so you, you We've had lots of discussions about <laughs> this as well. Um, I, not me I don't mean just not adding not, but I mean- Well, you know, so and or and not are sufficient no, but to- uh, What I mean, for example, you, you, uh, you, your experts are not unable to give any concept into the system. So you are just want to make logical operations on existing video streams. But the knowledge is often not, 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 so vi not visible. To, what we're trying to do is encapsulate the knowledge in the simple inputs that they're giving, right? And so far, the examples they've given, we've thought about, OK, well, can we do this with a simple box, a start, right? And so that's what we're trying to go after, because we don't want, you know, you keep seeing this like, oh yeah, we want to do this. Okay, well we can program it, but then tomorrow you're going to come in, yeah. Yeah, so we're going after kind of, you know, enablement, if you will, is our, our key. 